All right. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and it is a beautiful place. And of course, we hope that it cools off and it rains, um, which is what I used to say all the time when I was in New Mexico. So I'm kind of surprised to be saying that in, in Washington, uh, in Idaho. I'm sorry. So sequencing of multiple myeloma therapy. I think what we're looking for and would like to have someday with uh, in this disease would be a true sequence where. Uh, two follows one and three follows two, uh, a really clear-cut algorithm for the treatment of multiple myeloma. Uh, it's not present at this time, but uh, as I'm going to point out during the talk, uh, things are beginning to come together in a, in a manner that allows us to make suggestions about how to approach uh, patient therapy. And as Dr. Shaw said, uh, the fact that we have many, many agents gives us a lot more to think about. I have no disclosures. Uh, to start off with, I, I think in, in terms of true sequencing, the wit, what I might like to be able to offer you, a perfect algorithm for the treatment, a perfect and well-studied algorithm for the treatment of multiple myeloma patients throughout the duration of their lives with myeloma simply doesn't exist. Uh, and that's because patients are different and the disease is different from patient to patient. So we have to think about each patient as an individual and their disease and then synthesize that information along with our, the treatments that are available to decide how to approach them. Um, there have been a number of recent trials, though, that we're going to talk about that really that do help us to uh, understand where to go in the treatment of patients. And I think I'm going to talk briefly about frontline treatment and more specifically about several, uh, a number of phase three trials that are looking at the, the treatment space between the first and the third relapse. So that space is now becoming more and more defined, and that helps us to uh, understand where to go with these patients. For the, my feeling is that right now uh, in the f newly diagnosed uh, multiple myeloma patient, it's very straightforward. In general, in a newly diagnosed uh, multiple myeloma patient who's transplant eligible, and that's patients who are 18 to 75 years of age, and yes, we do unfortunately have people who are, uh, we have several patients in their 20s who have multiple myeloma, and we do, I think it's important to point out that transplant is routinely performed in the United States for multiple myeloma up to the age of 75, even older in some patients. It's approved by Medicare up to, I believe, the age of 78. So the literature can confuse you in that a lot of the literature refers to transplant only in patients under the age of 65, and that's because in other countries around the world, transplant is not paid for by their healthcare systems if you're 65 or older. So the studies are designed to accommodate that. In the United States, however, um, we do routinely transplant patients, and the, the benefits are still apparent. There's no reason to believe that someone who's 67 has a dramatically different uh, outcome than someone who's 64. So the, the standard approach would be RVD, uh, with or without upfront transplant. Upfront transplant is really the gold standard right now, and I'll talk to you uh, about why that is. But delayed transplant is not out of the question, and I'll also mention that as we go on. So there's your, your uh, beginning therapy for patients who are transplant eligible. In the non-transplant patients, uh, non-transplant eligible patients, I, I'm really glad to say that, that our therapies are so tolerable that we can still use essentially the same therapies. RVD is still a good therapy for someone who has comorbidities or age factors that would prevent them from being treated with a transplant. Many patients can tolerate this. You can modify the regimen to make it more tolerable. You can modify the dosages. It's a very tolerable regimen. And patients can continue to work. Patients can continue to raise their families. It's, it's really a great regimen, and, and even elderly patients can take it. Other options for upfront therapy, Revlimid and dexamethasone is a favorite, and I love it too. I love it as well as most of my colleagues because it's so simple. So we've got to love something that's simple, just pills, see the doctor once a month to every three months. It's uh, quite efficacious, so it's a great regimen for elderly patients in particular and patients in whom it's difficult to come back and forth for therapies on a weekly basis. Other options would include just bortezomib and dexamethasone. That's not used very often, uh, but it is an option. 
I think more often now, if someone's getting abortezomib-based regimen up front, cyclophosphamide will be included, and then they'll be getting either VCD or Cybor-D, uh, depending on how you deliver it. But usually it's the Cybor-D regimen. Um, now, this is a study, uh, a, a recently published study that has uh, helped to lead us to, I think, a standardization of frontline regimens for multiple myeloma. This is not the only trial uh, that's gotten us there, but it's uh, the most recently published one. And this is the IFM DFCI, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute 2009 trial, started or was conceived back in 2009, and the uh, some of the important results or early results have now been published. There's going to be a lot more data out about this trial. It's a 1,500 patient trial. Half the patients in France, uh, roughly in half in the United States. There's going to be a lot of genetic data coming out of this study. But uh, some of the early results, one of the key questions in this study was, what is the role of transplant, particularly upfront transplant, in the era of the new, tr new drugs for multiple myeloma? Does transplant still have an impact? And what uh, the approach in this uh, study was to give patients three cycles of RVD up front, then everyone was collected, half of patients got a transplant, and, ha and half of patients didn't. The transplant arm got two more consolidative cycles, so they got five cycles of RVD in total and a transplant, and the non-transplant arm uh, got five more cycles, so they got a total of eight cycles of RVD. And then everyone went on LEN maintenance. Um, importantly, this important thing to note, and this is going to be uh, a significant finding, but it'll be time before, it'll be years before we, this is published, but there is a big difference between the French and the U.S. arms. Originally, the study was supposed to be identical, but ultimately the French decided for various reasons to give just one year of maintenance lenalidomide, whereas in the United States, our uh, arm of the study, patients are getting indefinite lenalidomide maintenance. So that could uh, show big differences, um, and that'll be one of the other important outcomes of this trial as time goes on. Importantly, what the study showed was that there was a roughly nine-month progression-free survival difference between the upfront or early transplant and the delayed transplant arm. So far, there's been no difference in overall survival, but as time goes on, we may see that. When we combine all the data from the French and the United States, we may be able to see an overall survival difference. But there was a, an important progression-free survival difference, and because of that, transplant uh, remains uh, a key part of our frontline treatment for multiple myeloma in 2017, even with all the wonderful new drugs that we have. Now, moving on to what do you do after the first transplant and uh, frontline therapy and then maintenance when patients start to relapse. And this is just a cartoon I created just to remind us of sort of the lay of the land once people start to relapse. And that is that, in general, with the first relapse, patients tend to have good responses. They've got a high overall response rate, good uh, longer progression-free survival. Their VGPR and CR rates may be pretty good. But as we get into later relapses, second through fourth, and particularly in the late relapses, overall response rates are low, PFS is short, and we just have a, a not a very happy face, as you can see here. So this is something we have to keep in mind as we're treating these patients. It's part of the reason why many investigators really emphasize that at first relapse, uh, and up front, we want to treat, we want to get as much impact as we can uh, from the therapy and perhaps use the mo more aggressive therapies, triplets rather than doublets, uh, et cetera, because this is what your best opportunity to get deep, long-lived responses. So I just want to present uh, a case, and this is in reference to when do you treat somebody with relapsed multiple myeloma. And this is a patient we, of mine we saw last week in clinic. Uh, really wonderful 62-year-old woman who's a businesswoman, and uh, she was diagnosed in 2010 in Colorado uh, with 70% plasma cells and anemia, standard risk genetics. She had uh, bortezomib and dexamethasone for induction therapy and went on to have a transplant in, uh, in June 2011 and then maintenance lenalidomide for two years. Uh, she then discontinued the maintenance lenalidomide because of gastrointestinal issues. She was having soft stools and occasional diarrhea. 
that didn't work for her well and with her uh, very busy business life, and so she just stopped it. And, uh, and we said, we'll see what happens. And she's had a slow relapse since that time. So here are her uh, M spike values, and you can see, I can't point it out well, but she started to climb almost immediately after she, her M spike started to climb almost immediately after she could discontinued the maintenance lenalidomide, as one would expect. And as studies have demonstrated, when you go off of the maintenance therapy, people start relapsing. Um, the maintenance works. Um, a bone, two bone surveys and a bone marrow MRI have been done over the past four years as her M spike has slowly climbed. Now, I do want you to know I have been advising her that I'm getting more and more worried about not treating, but she's adamant that she doesn't want to be treated until she absolutely has to. And so she would like, she's 62 now, she said she's trying to get to 65 when she retires before she has to get another treatment. I don't think she's going to make it, but um, I am going along with her wishes, at least for the moment. So she's not yet been treated. Her result was still 1.1 was her recent M spike, and she still did not wish to be treated. So we're continuing to observe her once a month. So this brings up the topic of when do you treat patients who've relapsed? And um, there, are, there are a number of places in the literature where there's clear-cut advice about this. So definitely when patients have CRAB, that's a no-brainer. You need to restart treatment. In the patient I just presented, I've told her as soon as she has any anemia, any renal dysfunction, um, any hypercalcemia, I'm going to insist that she get treated. I'm thinking this morning about this case, I may come to a point where I have to fire her and say I can't be your doctor anymore because you need to be treated. I probably won't have to do that because I think she'll listen to me when I really twist her arm. But definitely when patients have CRAB and, and even very early CRAB, you should start retreating. Patients with a rapidly rising paraprotein level, and a good example is a little bit further down, if their monoclonal peak is doubling every three months, you should initiate treatment. You should probably initiate treatment. Trouble is right around the corner. Um, extramedullary disease, patients with disease that's uh, uh, tumor masses, for instance, that are outside of the bone marrow should be treated quickly. Uh, this, this, uh, there's data suggesting that or showing that these patients with extramedullary relapse do poorly. So you want to treat them aggressively. It's not something you want to observe. Um, but my main point here is that patients with a biological relapse do not need to be treated immediately. Um, you can do a watch and wait, a stringent watch and wait approach. What I tend to do is move them to a once a month. Uh, they may not have to see me, but I'm going to get laboratories once a month and see them every other month and tell them, um, you know, it's a watch and it's not a watch and wait, it's a watch and worry for me. Um, generally, once patients' M spike has risen to somewhere between 0 0.5 and 1, I'm beginning to really strongly recommend that they get treated. Uh, but we do have some guidance now in terms of when to treat people with relapsed myeloma, and you don't have to pull the trigger immediately. Things to think about when patients relapse uh, that you have to take into consideration when you're choosing your regimen is uh, the patient and the nature of their disease. So patients who have high-risk cytogenetics, things like deletion 17P, 414, uh, 1420, um, uh, translocation, you're going to worry a lot more about them, and you should treat them more aggressively and generally with triplets. Um, so that's going to be an important consideration. Um, patients who uh, have dysfunction, have renal dysfunction, uh, rarely does hepatic dysfunction uh, play a role in my treatment of patients, but people who don't have normal uh, uh, organ function, particularly the kidneys, that will impact uh, how you decide to treat them. I've already mentioned extramedullary disease is a bad prognostic finding, and in the, the later relapse patients, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, a, a very important thing to consider is how long, what was the duration of response to the previous therapy. If a patient had two to, enjoyed two to three years or two to four years of response to their earlier therapy, then, or as the patient I presented who's had a very slow uh, relapse, it's clearly not aggressive disease right now, um, you can use less aggressive therapies, perhaps even a doublet. But in patients uh, who had short responses, uh, either they relapsed while on therapy or within six months to a year of therapy, you should be considering more aggressive therapy because their disease is telling you that it's more aggressive, regardless of what the genetics say. Um, 
Performance status and comorbid conditions are, of course, important. And I think really, uh, yeah, a thing that's come comes to mind now is we're fortunate to have both oral therapies and injectable and IV therapies is the preferences of the patient and the ability of the patient to come back and forth to clinic for frequent uh, in injections, either subcutaneously or intravenously. That makes a big difference to patients and I think personally it really impacts their quality of life. Having to be in clinic all the time, they have to get more blood testing, they're up in the infusion suite all the time. It's something to consider and I think you have to discuss it at length with the patient and to try and understand their, their preferences and their goals of care. Now, um, I don't take care of patients. I'm, uh, I used to, for many years, take care of patients who were in the mode of whatever you say, doc, uh, because I used to work in a county, county university type setting in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But I don't see those types of patients where I am now at the SCCA. So there's a lot of discussion usually going around uh, dis uh, treatment decisions with almost every patient that I see. And that's good, that's good. Uh, we've already covered this material. So uh, now let's review the, the key studies that I mentioned earlier, the phase three trials that I think are helping to guide us in what to do in the first through fourth, uh, first through third relapsed patient. Um, first of all, we're going to discuss patients who have uh, retained their, uh, we believe, you believe it, or have retained their response to lenalidomide. Uh, the, the reference for this is cut off, but I can provide it later if you'd like it. Um, it's from a recent review in blood. Um, so these are in patients who've retained their lenalidomide response and some various studies that uh, uh, have been done in that space, that treatment space. I don't have a pointer, so I don't think I uh, have too much jumping out on this to guide me on which one we're talking about. But Aspire, uh, carfilzomib, uh, or lenalidomide dex with or without carfilzomib, an exciting uh, study, I think, with we uh, participated in and with some dramatic responses. We've had a lot of good luck with carfilzomib-based regimens in our practice. Um, very significant difference, as you can see, in overall response rate. The depth of response, importantly, was dramatically different, and many, many studies now have clearly demonstrated that depth of response translates to improved PFS and almost certainly overall survival in multiple myeloma. Now studies don't always go on long enough to show the overall survival benefit, but depth of response in general translates to overall survival improvement, even in high-risk patients. So uh, a major difference in the depth of response between Lendex and uh, Carfilzomib Lendex, and so the, the challenge with that uh, approach is more, many more visits to the clinic, potential for cardiopulmonary toxicity, is, which is real, not super high, but it is real, um, but it is a very good regimen. Uh, tourmaline, which is uh, an exciting new approach to multiple myeloma, triplet therapy that's all oral. Um, that's that's uh, hard to beat, uh, and uh, I think I'm saying I think this is going to be what I'll call my island man uh, or my island therapy because I take care of a number of people who live on islands in the Northwest and people in Alaska. Great therapy for them. Uh, they don't have to be coming into the clinic because it's an all oral regimen with exazomib, um, uh, Lendex. And it has uh, good response rates, as you can see, 78% and had a significant pr progression-free survival advantage over just Lendex. It also has significantly lower neuropathy than using uh, bortezomib Lendex, so uh, it is a, a good therapy and we are using it uh, at our clinic. Um, and the, the convenience of it is, is impressive. Eloquent 2 is a study comparing Lendex to ELO Lendex, and ELO being one of our exciting new monoclonal antibodies in uh, multiple myeloma against SLAM7, large study uh, with a uh, significant difference in res overall response rate and uh, somewhat a modest difference in the depth of response, uh, but again, an improvement, a significant improvement versus just Lendex. This is a very well tolerated drug. Uh, a well-tolerated combination, and the patients that I have on it uh, are doing extremely well. So uh, I've been impressed when I've used this, this combination in, in patients. The, I think one of the downsides might be that 
As you get into the maintenance phase of uh, elotuzumab, it's every other week if you follow the, the practice that's been done so far. So somewhat more visits to the clinic for the patient. The, there aren't, uh, the frequency of infusion reactions is lower than the other monoclonal antibody. So that's a big positive because infusion reactions are a problem with daratumumab, which I'll talk about now. So in the Pollock study, uh, Lendex was uh, compared to daratumumab Lendex. And with, uh, this is a very exciting regimen uh, because of the major differences in overall response, de depth of response, and in the PFS, uh, it had not yet been reached in the treatment arm versus the standard therapy arm, uh, hazard ratios that are, are quite impressive. Downsides of this regimen, um, it, one for everyone who's in practice is, of course, the infusion reactions. And I do get a number of calls from around the Northwest about how do we deal with infusion reactions. I was under the impression that we were having a lot of problems with them recently. Uh, so I went and spoke, worked with our uh, infusion uh, chief, and we looked at the last 300 infusions of daratumumab and uh, I think only one or two patients was unable to get the infusion in, uh, there in the first day, uh, over the first day. So we're not splitting infusions at our center. I know some centers do do that, but I think as you gain experience with the drug and give, unique, give the special training, a little bit of special training because it's not rituximab, it's a little bit different to your infusion nurses, you'll get used to it and, and find that you can get the drug in in time and not have to split it over two days. So that's a very exciting regimen. So, and it is, uh, the long-term daratumumab is once a month, which is somewhat of an advantage, fewer visits to the clinic. Um, I have had a couple of patients tell me, not with the triplet, but with the doublet with daratumumab, that um, it's the best regimen they'd ever been on, it was multiple myeloma. These were heavily pretreated patients and it just, uh, the, amount of side effects was very, very low. And that's just anecdotal, but it was interesting and gratifying to hear. Uh, we are beginning to see overall survival benefits in these triplets. And as I mentioned, uh, the depth of response ultimately should translate to survival benefit. So the Aspire trial uh, just a month ago reported a 7.9 month uh, overall survival benefit. So that's exciting and really proof of principle in my mind. Now, in patients who are still responsive to uh, bortezomib, there have been four major studies, uh, four studies worth talking about today. Um, three of them are phase three. Panorama uh, was a study using uh, uh, a histone deacetylase inhibitor, panabinostat, in combination with bortezomib. Um, the overall response rate was uh, modest. Uh, we don't have the data on the difference between the depth of response, but there was a significant difference in progression-free survival, and so that regimen is available. Some downsides of this regimen are neuropathy, of course, with uh, bortezomib is always a worry, and it's a real issue, as anyone who takes care of a lot of myeloma knows. Um, Panabinostat has some downsides, and histac histone deacetylase inhibitors to date all have them, at least in myeloma gastrointestinal side effects, diarrhea, um, and thrombocytopenia. So this regimen is not high on the list for many myeloma treaters, but it is an option and patients can respond because of the addition of the histone deacetylase inhibitor, which is oral, um, which is a unique uh, mechanism of action. Castor uh, is another trial using daratumumab, so uh, bortezomib dex with or without daratumumab. Uh, very uh, significant overall response rate difference. The depth of response, again, markedly different, um, essentially a doubling. And uh, again, the PFS has not yet been reached in the treatment arm versus the standard therapy arm. So another impressive result using this monoclonal antibody, um, which is likely to become uh, rituxim our rituximab for, appears to be becoming our rituximab in multiple myeloma, which is something to celebrate because we've been waiting for that for a long time. There is a phase two, a randomized phase two study looking at bortezomib dex with or without elotuzumab, and there were uh, important differences in the depth of response and in the progression-free survival. That's not an approved regimen, but it's something that uh, you might consider. Um, and then the Endeavor trial 
which is an important study that directly compared carfilzomib index versus bortezomib index. And it again showed uh, significant differences in overall response and major differences in the depth of response and uh, strongly uh, telling us that carfilzomib is a unique agent, a unique proteasome inhibitor. And again, uh, a few months ago, this study, this uh, study demonstrated progression-free, I'm sorry, overall survival benefits for carfilzomib versus bortezomib. So some of our newer agents, our second and third generation agents, are truly better, not just in progression-free survival, but in overall survival. And it fits with what we're seeing in the clinic. Patients are living longer, thank goodness. So first relapse of myeloma. Certainly uh, in patients who had a good response to their initial therapy, um, repeating it is uh, very worth considering. Triplets in general are better than doublets, uh, deeper responses, more prolonged responses. If patients uh, aren't physically uh, up to getting a triplet, a doublet is reasonable, um, but repeating induction therapy is certainly a, a reasonable approach. Um, this is just various acronyms for the regimens we've just discussed. We've talked a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of each drug, and I think the patient's preferences are very important. Their preferences and their ability to come into the clinic and uh, to tolerate more frequent visits, more frequent infusions versus less, uh, those are important things to take into consideration and probably help me a lot to make my decisions about the sequencing of therapy in these patients. And, and again, as I mentioned, Getting a d the deepest, r the best response you can with that first relapse may be of particular importance because they're going to lose their response relapse as you go through, march through their various relapses in their myeloma career. There is, in the literature, uh, suggestions and discussion that perhaps carfilzomib is a particularly good agent to use in patients with very aggressive relapses, and we certainly use that often, that uh, carfilzomib-based regimens in our practice for patients with rapid, aggressive relapses, combined, of course, with an immunomodulatory drug like lenalidomide, which is approved. Uh, and by the way, and obviously I'm giving a lot of off uh, approved uh, regimens here, but that's what we're doing right now in multiple myeloma. Or combined with pomalidomide, uh, what appears to be another excellent regimen. We don't yet have approval for that. Uh, th there is data uh, suggesting that both carfilzomib and pomalidomide have unique activities in high-risk multiple myeloma, so that may be a particularly attractive regimen in your high-risk aggressive relapses. Because some of these patients, like the DEL-17 patients, once they relapse, it may be very hard and, in fact, not even possible to get them back into a second remission or uh, a third remission. So you want to treat them aggressively. A and in addition, patients with high-risk genetics or very aggressive disease, they need a pro proteasome inhibitor. That's uh, uh, throughout the literature. If this is first relapse and the patient did delay their transplant, as many patients have, some estimates are that perhaps half of patients in the United States over the last few years have, did not get an upfront transplant, I strongly recommend, and the literature uh, corroborates that, that they get their, that transplant at first relapse. We don't know what the benefit is of getting it after the first relapse. It's not as clear. We do know that there is data uh, that they retain the overall survival benefit when they get relapse, uh, when they get a transplant at first relapse. So I strongly suggest to patients that they not delay a transplant any further than that point in time. Of course, then, then that would then be followed again by maintenance. We have many, many options for maintenance. Not all of them are approved. Uh, specifically for maintenance post-transplant, lenalidomide, of course, recently did receive approval. Um, but many options for maintenance in patients who have very aggressive disease and or high risk genetic disease. I am now using triplet regimens. I'll modify them so they're more tolerable, but I do sometimes use uh, modifications of RVD or KRD in very high risk patients because the chances that you're gonna get them out of a, a second or a third relapse are not very good. The second and fourth relapse of myeloma are essentially very sim similar, and you're going to be making these decisions, based, again, uh, except in the high-risk patients, which I've just covered, in standard-risk patients as they march through their second, third, and fourth relapses, 
um, you're going to want to uh, either escalate to the next generation uh, drug and in, in the Im immunomodulatory drugs you should go from lenalidomide to pomalidomide if they were responding to if they were responding to a PI or you want to continue to use a PI go from bortezomib to carfilzomib and or consider adding in uh, if they're failing uh, relapsing consider uh, adding in a drug with a novel mechanism of action like one of the monoclonal antibodies. What I don't have on this slide, and I should, but it is coming up, is clinical trials, clinical trials, clinical trials. Um, they, all the wonderful things that we're talking about um, are available only because of clinical trials. This is still an ugly disease in many patients, and we can't afford to treat it uh, without a lot of respect. So we need new drugs and better drugs. And then maintenance, I've talked about the numerous options for maintenance already. So um, I'm going to skip through this so I don't, uh, so I don't get uh, too far behind. I only have a minute anyway, but I'm getting there. Late relapse, uh, four plus. What do you do? Hard to say. No good choices. First choice is a clinical trial. Then there's a number of older agents that um, we do use sometimes. Bendamestine is an option, pegylated doxorubicin. I generally don't recycle previously used agents and drug combinations if possible, um, but that is an option. I think looking for new drugs is the way to go. And uh, salvage with uh, a VTD pace like regimen is a possibility. skip through this, although I hate to skip through this paper that Dr. Kumar got, but uh, this wonderful paper, but it's worth looking at his paper on double refractory patients because um, we're the, the, only, the solution to them now is the monoclonal antibodies, but we're soon going to be having triple refractory, refractory to PIs, IMIDs, and monoclonal antibodies. These patients don't do well. We need new strategies. So if you have a patient with a late relapse of myeloma, what should you do? Should you refer them for a trial? Is there really anything out there with promise? There really is. It's, there truly is. There are many new and dramatically different drugs, to name a few. Got the list up there, and we've used some of those we've had the opportunity to use in our uh, research studies. So I highly recommend that for your patients you search for good studies and get your patients to them. These are some of the abstracts that were presented on these new agents that all of them have completely different mechanisms of action, and they do, as many of them have significant signals that they're working. Uh, CAR T cells are coming. We'll be opening a CAR T cell, two CAR T cell studies at uh, the SCCA uh, by the end of this year. So, and there have been some very exciting uh, early studies in CAR T cells for multiple myeloma, so hopefully uh, that is going to gain traction. And uh, I think I'm about out of time, so we don't, what do we do? What's the perfect sequence? We don't have one. Um, there are many different situations and combinations. I think talking very carefully with your patient, of course, it, it doesn't work very well with RVUs and the 20 minutes or 30 minutes you have scheduled to see them in clinic, but it's the only way to do this. I, call, I look at the clinicaltrials.gov for my patient, and then I call around and find studies for them and recommend them to them, help them to get to them if I can. If we don't have a good study or there isn't a good study in Seattle, sometimes we would refer a patient to Swedish if, we, if they have a good study. Um, do we use all these drugs at the same time, sort of the kitchen sink principle, um, or do we seek, actually string them out over time? We don't know. Uh, studies, hopefully, uh, studies are beginning to be done actually looking at true sequencing. Um, the best duration of treatment with these agents is not known, but continuous therapy with something is the name of the game right now in multiple myeloma. And as I've showed, yes, the, the, the improved progression tree survival of triplets is now uh, uh, showing us improved overall survival. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and uh, we'll conclude. Thank you, Dr. Libby.